Hello one and all, my name is John Clare, this is John's Dark Heart, and as always, you are very welcome. Now, today's piece, the one I'm talking about, is Hugin and Moonin. Um, I'll bring up a few now here. As you can see, this is two crows. Again, John likes crows. I know, it's hardly a surprise now, is it? But, uh, with this particular piece, the name comes from the two ravens that accompanied Odin and also acted as his spies on Midgard on Earth. Now, I believe the rough translation of that is thought and memory. The way I would translate that would be the past and the future. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go into the time-lapse replay, we're gonna go into the process, and we'll talk about the making of it and everything else. And we're gonna do that now. Okay, so now here we are, we're in Procreate. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go into my finished work folder. I'm gonna bring up Hugo and Moonin now. There we go. These are the two birds in question. This is Hugin and Moonin. They're two crows, two ravens, two corvids of some description, we'll call them. And if I turn around to the side here, I don't know if you can read that, and if you can, hopefully I got it right, <laughs> because I'm not a speaker of it myself. But this is in, in Norse runes, old Norse runes, and it says Hugin and Moonin, the, the names of the two birds in question. As I said before, these are the two birds that used to uh, basically act as Odin's eyes and ears, you know, they go down to Midgard and find out what, you know, whatever Thor was getting up to or, you know, whatever, you know, us mere mortals were doing. So if we go into the canvas information, there we are. Um, this is something I finished around about August last year. So if we go into statistics, um, as you can probably see here, I've done 19,313 strokes and I spent 42 hours and 28 minutes on it. So as you can imagine, like a lot of my work, it's very involved. It took me a long time to do this. Um, so if we go in now to, we go into time-lapse replay and we hit the play button, here we are. And there we go. And for, some, <laughs> for some reason, I start at it upside down. Um, but here we are. So I'm gonna start. I'm starting out on the uh, one of the core vids. At this stage here, it's just a case of like getting my line work down, drawing everything out. And again, because I wait, wait a minute, I'm gonna just check something out quickly. Do I still have the layers? I, I do. Good stuff. So what you can see here is like what I. If I turn that one off, what you can see there is I actually drew only what was necessary. This is one of the few times where I actually had the forethought to do that because basically it's a case of composition. So initially, if we go back into the time map replay, you can tell early on that I roughed, oh, and I, I roughed everything out. So the idea was, um, what I was doing here is I was essentially establishing the composition, and roughing, like, roughing it out and trying to come up with the idea of what I want the finished piece to look like, right? To get kind of a clear idea in my head exactly how it was gonna turn out. And I think if I go this, I think at this stage, this is like the early, if we pull out a little bit so you can see a bit clearer. This is like the early composition of it. This is roughly how I wanted it to look in the end. Obviously, there are minor changes to it, as you can probably tell from the uh, from the finished piece, but this was the rough idea I was going, going with. So once I kind of had that kind of worked out, then I started um, filling out the details for the, for the raven or crow or whatever in the foreground, and started filling out those details. And this is something, I, these little breast feathers is something I admit I had a little bit of trouble with. Um, you could, Cause I actually, I think, yes, I redrew them a few times. And I think basically what I started off doing was I was starting, initially it was almost like it looked too, too, what's the word I'm looking for? It looked too ordered. It was too tidy. I wanted to look a little bit more scraggly, if that's a word. And so initially, that's what I did. I kind of, I worked through it until I was happy with it. And that's what, again, I evangelize it a lot. Great thing about working digital, you can really kind of, if you're not happy with something, you can remove it and completely start again. And it's quite, it, for me, it is a very useful feature. So let's pull out a little bit. That's the one thing with Time but it gives you the illusion that this, this took no time at all. Oh my word, it took a long time. There's a reason why this took 42 hours to finish. If you look at, also, if you look up up here, I mean, this is the wrist, this is actually the wrist of the bird. We're punching, again, we're gonna lose detail because we're punching in quite a lot. But what I done here was, I, once I drew out the feathers, then I started shading him. 
So you still can see the impressions that of the feathers there, but the, also you have tone there. So it still looks kind of, in my mind, it looks as it should do. The same thing happened here with these feathers, with all of these feathers. I just kind of drew them out, filled them in, and then afterwards, after the fact, came in and just kind of using, again, one thing that's really useful about Procreate or any other drawing out there, because they, I think more or less they all do a similar thing, where if I you're drawing with technical pencil, drop into a, a razor, you can do the same thing there. So you can add and subtract something I, you know, say quite a lot, I do appreciate. But it's important that I kind of keep mentioning that because like, it is a useful technique. And if you are if you are on Procreate and you for some reason want to repl um, replicate my, my style of work, that's it. what I'm essentially trying to do here is I'm trying to show you how, it, how you can do it. So that's what I'm doing here. Also, so that area was all shaded in black, and I wanted to, I want basically, yeah, I, I, I blocked out in black, but I still wanted there to be detail. So I, I shade, I, using my eraser, I removed some of the tone to brighten it up a little bit, and then started adding detail in with my brush after the fact, and then shaded to go over it again to bring it back down again. So there's still the impression of the feathers there, but it's still in shadow. So you, you, it's you don't have to like depict everything. You know, you can sometimes you can take a few shortcuts. It's, I mean, I wouldn't feel too guilty about doing it because at the end of the day, most people, when they're looking at your work or anyone's work for that matter, what they're doing is they're going to be looking at it from a distance anyway. It's only people like me, like art nerds like me, who will go up close and try to figure out how a, a, a how a how the paint was applied or how the mark was made. You know. In retrospect, though, I think I'm not happy with those feet. And it's something I may actually, something I may actually revisit further down the line. I may actually redraw those. It may yet happen. I'm not too sure. So okay. So the first one was finished, and now with the second one, I start filling it out. I think this is where I kind of formalised the composition of the piece. And again, very similar. If we, go, if we punch in a little bit and we pull back a touch. I mean, a lot of it is refinement. I mean, you can see here, again, using the selection tool, eyes too big, so what did I do? I shrank it down. Beak was too, I felt the beak was too short, so I extended it out. Then, using my eraser brush, I took away some of the detail. I need to bring it back again. Also, another thing I mentioned in the last video was, I might, I'll roughly sketch out my lines, then I'll come back with a technical pen, a razor brush, and then I'll clean those lines up. Now, you may do it a different way. You may do one layer for sketching, and one layer for kind of like the more um, precise drawing. You know, we all have our different processes and ways of working. There's no harm in that. Again, what's important is the end result, in my humble opinion, at least anyway. So as you can see what I did there, um, I kind of lightly, kind of placed where all the feathers were and where the marks were. And once I was happy with that, then I came over and added in the detail, added in my contrast, filled it out a little bit more. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of fine tuning going on as well, as you can probably tell. Like it's not just a case of bring it up, bring it down. Sometimes it's bring it up, bring it down, bring it up, bring it down, bring it up, bring it down. You know, there's a lot of fine tuning going on. There's a lot of light tweaking as I'm drawing. And initially I was going to do it in English, Hugin and Moon, as you can see there. Yeah, so that initially it was gonna be done in English, Hugin and Moon, but I felt it would be a bit more apt and more, more appropriate, more to the point, um, that it'd be done in Norse script. So I changed it up and changed it to Norse script. And there we are, that's it done. So what we'll do is we'll round this out now, shall we? Okay, so that was Hugin and Mooney. Again, it's a piece I'm relatively happy with, maybe aside from the feet, but the, again, great thing about working digital is I can change that at any point. But before I'm going to change that, guess what? I'm putting out for sale on my website, www.johnsdarkart.com. And again, as always, the prints are available in two different sizes, A3, we sell those at 75 euros, and A4, we sell those at 45 euros. So if you're interested in what I do, you'd like to support us with what we're doing here, then please head over there, pick yourself up a print, be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay, so now the sales pitch is out of the way, we can talk about the inspiration behind the work. So where this comes from, where Hugin and Mugin and specifically comes from is Norse mythology. 
Empire, um, as I mentioned before, Hugo and Moonin were the spies for Odin on Midgard. They'd report back to him what Thor was doing, what Loki was doing, or whoever else in the Norse, in the Norse pantheon, and what the humans were doing on Midgard, or what the elves were doing in Alfheim, or whatever. And the great thing about mythologies and how they've been carried down through, through the ages is their retelling. And where my interest in Norse mythology came from was, if I bring it up here now, is Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology. He's a, both a wonderful storyteller, a wonderful writer. He's one of my favorite writers. American Gods, Neverwhere, Sandman. Like he's got a list of credits a mile long. As I said, one of my favorite writers. And also he wonderfully narrates Norse mythology in Audible. And got to admit, his voice is the oral, as in A-U-R-L, don't get it twisted, uh, is the oral equivalent of eating a bar of Cadbury's chocolate. It's velvety smooth. Yeah, it's that retelling and that inspiration that led to me creating this piece. And that's the wonderful thing. I mean, I keep saying like inspiration is something that finds you working, but also inspiration is something that comes to you not just while you're creating artwork, but also like there is no definite way that inspiration strikes you. When it does, it does. In order for you to kind of de um, to kind of derive inspiration for something, you need to be taking things in. If you want your work to have a more political bent, then you need to have an ear to the ground and what's going on politically, whether it's national or international. If you're looking to depict things that are more kind of esoteric and or something a bit more introverted, you know, you might want to take an interest in storytelling or psychology or whatever i mean there's 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 so many different ways in which you can derive inspiration and that's where like what you want to really do is you want to kind of develop a well of inspiration you want to have a well of influences whether that's other artists music books stories whatever it, the more of that you accumulate over time the more of a wellspring that you can draw from and it doesn't matter what your influences are. I mean, whether you're just one of these kids who like really likes manga and Naruto, you know, I'm not a big fan of it. I don't really know all that much about it. But if you're a fan of Naruto or Dragon Ball Z, great, draw those characters and eventually develop your own. Like for instance, myself, right? What did I start doing as a teenager? I just basically comic, I, I copied comic books. So I drew Wolverine and Spider-Man and whoever else. And in this day and age, it's more manga. Um, it's more. It seems to be a lot more kind of manga focused with a lot of young people, and that's a great thing. I think that's fantastic because it's that interest in drawing that will become an interest in art and expression. You start off by, you know, you start off with quite a limited um, set of inspirations, but then they will broaden out over time. If you're really into Tolkien, you know. If you're really into the Lord of the Rings and you want to depict Saruman or uh, or Frodo Baggins or whatever, if you're really into if you're really into Dungeons and Dragons and you want to draw characters for all your pals in your in your game of Dungeons and Dragons, whatever it is, you know, inspiration is this wonderful thing that can come to you. But the more influence you allow yourself to absorb, the wider um, a wellspring of inspiration you can draw from. And I think it's really important that you kind of as a creative or as an artist you allow yourself to do that and the more you do it obviously the better your work will be in the long run i feel at least anyway uh, i think we'll wrap it up here so if this provides you with any inspiration to carry on working please do so and share it with the world in whatever way you see fit my name's been john clare this has been john starkart and as always you have been very welcome till next time